Every year, I drive over to Las Colinas, Texas to participate in the Let's Play Gaming Expo. I usually arrive the night before the expo begins to help set up the Vintage Computer Museum, which is just a small part of the expo, but obviously my favorite part. I also bring several systems from my own collection for participants to play around on. We have quite an active retro community around here, so a lot of collectors show up to bring in various things. And after a few hours, we transform this room into a vintage computer playground. Next door to our computer room, there's a larger room for vintage consoles being set up. Now, this room has pretty much every console imaginable up and running. And while a lot of them are somewhat more modern consoles like the Xbox, there are quite a few original Nintendo and PlayStation consoles set up. Downstairs in the main area, arcade machines are being set up, and the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is presiding over them. And the vendor areas are just about ready to go. This is like the calm before the storm. These are the computers I brought this year, uh, starting here with the Tandy Color Computer 2 with a Tetris cartridge, then the VIC-20 with a Cheese and Onion cartridge, next is the Atari 400 with Donkey Kong, and finally of course is the Commodore PET in all of its restored glory. And as you can see, we ended up with quite a few computers. I also brought a few rare items for display, even though they aren't hooked up, including the Commodore 116 with accessories, and the Commodore Max. The next morning, the whole place started to fill up with people, including the arcade area and the vendor area. We even had a special room full of Emacs that were running network games of Duke Nukem 3D, which was quite a hit. There was a room called the Chimera Laboratorium, where, uh, gee, how should I explain this? There were hundreds of stuffed animals, and people would take the animals and cut parts off and put them on other animals like Dr. Frankenstein. And a lot of people seemed to get a kick out of this, including my daughter and her friend Jordan. And of course we had cosplay. Lots and lots of cosplay. Back up in our little computer museum, people were starting to fill in and play on the vintage computers. The systems I brought were particularly popular with the crowd, even the pet. But um, we had some other neat systems, including one of those rare uh, Macintosh Anniversary Editions, and we had a couple of Apple II systems set up running the Oregon Trail that were quite a hit. And uh, we had the new Super Mario Bros. conversion running on the Commodore 64. And we also had the original Tetris running on an original Soviet-era computer that, uh, that it was designed for, which was also a pretty big hit. But you probably didn't click on this video to see any of those things. You came here to see my presentation on working for AST Technical Support back in the 1990s. So let's get started on that. Okay, so the company started out around the year of 1980 or approximately in there, and they called themselves AST Research. Now, a lot of people wanted to know, they, they always asked me, or even back then always asked, what does AST stand for? And yeah, some people actually pronounced it AST. I used to get phone calls, people say, is this AST computer? No, it's, it's AST. But anyway, what it actually stands for is the um, first three initials of the three guys that uh, founded the company, which is Albert Wong, Safi Qureshi, and Thomas Yen. So nothing fancy there, but, but that's where it came from. So just to give you an idea of perspective of the size of AST, they were the third largest computer company in the world. Uh, during the 1990s, right under Compaq and Dell. It's sensible for your business to have a PC from AST who's got people picking up the phone seven days a week and at hours when you should be out socializing. AST Bravo PCs featuring Intel Pentium 2 processors. Vice President Al Gore continues his Southland tour with a visit to Orange County. This morning he met with the employees of a Fountain Valley computer company. The visit to AST Research Company is part of the Vice President's campaign to reinvent government. So they didn't do anything historically significant like Apple or Commodore, or, you know, some of those people. So you don't tend to remember AST. And you kind of imagine if Dell had gone out of business in 1997, we probably wouldn't think much about them either because they didn't do anything terribly historically significant. But they were a very important big company at the time, and so was AST. And so that's just to give you a little bit of a an idea of the scale of the company. Now they actually started off producing products like this. This is an AST six pack card. Now um, the purpose of a card like this would be uh, the original IBM PCs and some of the clones, you know, they had, I don't know, five, six, seven uh, expansion slots, but they were always filled with things like serial cards, parallel cards, floppy controllers, stuff like that. And so when you wanted to add new cards, sometimes there just wasn't any room. So 
what AST come up with is they combine all of these things into a single card. So this card here, for example, has a floppy controller, it has RAM, it has a, um, a real-time clock, it has serial and parallel. And so it took all of those functions into one card. And uh, so this was a, actually a very desirable card to have for early PCs and clones. And uh, they actually made these cards for um, the Apple II and uh, the P uh, PS2 microchannel architecture as well. And uh, these cards were actually very profitable and very desirable. The only problem was, um, as time went by, uh, motherboard manufacturers started integrating more of this stuff onto the motherboards. So eventually these cards kind of became redundant, like unnecessary, just didn't need them anymore. So their business started to decline a little bit. And so they wanted to move into new markets. So they decided to build their own PC. Now this is not necessarily the first ever AST PC model, but it's one of the first ever. And I think this is like a 286 or something like that. And this was actually well before the time that, that I ended up working there. So um, they actually ended up changing the name from AST Research to AST Computer. They also tweaked the font a little bit. And so if you ever come across a computer and you see one or the other, some people might think, well, that might be a different company like AST Research or AST Computer, but it's actually the same company. In fact, there's actually a few computers you can find that have both logos on them. Uh, it'll say AST Computer on the front and AST Research like on a sticker or something on the back because they just hadn't updated the sticker yet. <laughs> so. Um, they started off in California and Irvine and the Mountain View area, and they were actually really, really successful. And they were um, actually maxed out at manufacturing capacity, which is a good problem to have. They actually could not produce enough computers to meet demand. So they had to expand. And one of the places they chose to expand to was Fort Worth, Texas. Now, the way they actually ended up doing this was they made a deal with Tandy Radio Shack. And of course, that's how I ended up working for ASD because of the facility in, in Fort Worth. So the deal with Tandy Radio Shack was um, kind of interesting because one of the things that we did is we actually took over Tandy's manufacturing facilities and their support facilities. And so that meant when we gave support uh, for AST, we also had to support Tandy and Grid because Tandy had bought Grid a few years earlier. And so that meant in our uh, support facilities, we actually took phone calls for Tandy and Grid uh, along with Samsung, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. But uh, yeah, so I, I often had to answer the phone. If it said Tandy on the screen of my phone, I would answer the phone, Tandy tech support. And I, I had to, to support those machines too. But those machines were all at, very much at end of life. We didn't get that many uh, calls from them. But one of the parts of this deal that was also supposed to happen is we were supposed to be selling our AST computers in Radio Shack since they would no longer be selling Tandy computers there. However, for some reason or another, that fell through, and I've never been able to find out exactly why that didn't happen. And they ended up going with, I think, Compaq instead, if memory serves. So we never sold AST computers in Radio Shack stores, but that was originally part of the deal, and that was supposed to happen. So if you look at um, this graph, and this is just kind of a rough graph showing the, like the prosperity of, of AST uh, throughout the years. And uh, that first part up to around, I don't know, like 1987, that was when they were building their expansion cards, which was, you know, it was profitable for them. And then, you know, they kind of hit their peak. And then, like I said, the motherboard manufacturers started integrating all that stuff and their business started to decline. And then when they started building their PCs, that's when the business shot up drastically. And that was when they were like king of the world for a little while. And then they started like very rapidly going bankrupt. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why they um, went bankrupt. First and foremost is poor quality. Now, to be fair, AST had some of the most reliable computers on the market up until they had started hitting that decline. Part of the reason the quality went bad, which happened around the time they purchased the Tandy facility, um, had to do with the competitiveness in the PC market had changed dramatically over the last few years, and it got to where the, there was fierce price competition, and everybody had to cut costs in order to keep their product competitive. And there were different ways to accomplish that. Unfortunately, AST ended up cutting, uh, cutting a, lot of <laughs> a lot of quality out. So uh, just as an example of how bad some of the machines were, uh, we had this one called the AST Ascension 950N. It was a laptop computer, and it was, it was terrible. Uh, I mean, people were calling in constantly with, uh, you know, plastic pieces were breaking and falling off, the screen hinges were breaking, the screens would go out, the... And yes, they even caught on fire and melted. In fact, it was quite a common call. Say, I got up this morning, there was this terrible stench in my house, and my computer is like half of it's like melted. And you know, so these were the kinds of problems that the Ascension 950 had. In fact, I talked to one of the uh, our database guys, and he ran a, a database query one time 
for me, and he said the uh, return rate on the Ascension 950N was 110%. <laughs> so for those who don't know what that means, that means every single one of them manufactured had been returned at least once, and some of them had been returned twice. And I know I took some phone calls from people who it was their third or fourth time to return the computer for repair. So, I mean, they were, they were that bad, and they were costing us a fortune on the back end to support these machines, uh, even if they were profitable when they were originally sold. So that was one problem. Um, another problem was we continued to domestically produce most of our computers, even our laptop computers, where all of our competitors had started to produce their laptop computers in places like Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, where they were much cheaper to produce, and um, we just couldn't be cost competitive. Not only that, but we still sourced a lot of our components in the U.S., which, don't get me wrong, I'm all for U.S. manufacturing stuff, but nevertheless, this is, this is the reality of what happened. So as an example, we were still using Creative Lab Sound Blaster chips on a lot of our motherboards, and that was something we could brag about, saying, hey, we have Creative Labs, all these other guys got them clone sound chips. But the reality was the ESS and Crystal sound chips they were getting from uh, the Asian markets were much cheaper. They were just as reliable and mostly just as compatible as the Creative chips. So there wasn't really a lot of advantage at this point, especially in the world of running Windows, which is kind of where we were at this point. There wasn't a whole lot of advantage to having a Creative Labs sound chip in your computer. But yeah, a lot of stuff like that was uh, keeping us from being uh, competitive uh, on cost. So they ended up cutting cost in... Um, other areas. <laughs> but really the biggest problem, and this is probably the biggest problem led to the, down, um, the decline of AST was sales channel problems. And let me explain how this works. So our competitors at the time, such as Dell and Gateway, they didn't even, they didn't even manufacture a computer until the customer had already ordered and paid for the computer. Uh, AST, we worked through retailers. So <laughs> We had salespeople who would, you know, call up the retailers and try to sell them our AST computers. And I'm just going to give you, I don't know exact numbers, I'm just going to throw a, a numeric example out there. So let's say they're talking to one retailer, and they said, yeah, we want to order 500,000 of this machine for, for sale in the country. And the salesman would be like, why don't you order a million instead, we'll give you a little bit better deal. And the retailer would say, well, we don't really, we don't think we can sell a million of them, so we don't want to buy that many. Uh, and so our salesperson would say, well, tell you what we'll do. If you'll buy the million, and if you can't sell them all within a certain amount of agreed upon time, you can start cutting the price, and we'll pay the difference on the back end. So the salesman got his big commission because he sold all these extra computers, but then, of course, guess what always happened? We ended up having to pay the retailers to sell our computers on the back end, and, of course, that costs a lot of money. In fact, I remember when we made the deal with Walmart, everybody come through, we were cheering and saying, oh yes, this is going to save the company. We made this big deal with Walmart. We're going to sell so many computers through Walmart. And we saw ads on TV from Walmart, walked into Walmart, saw the computers on the shelves. We got calls from customers at Walmart. Um, so it seemed like it was going great. And then six months later, they pulled the plug on the Walmart deal and they told us, well, we lost $200 on every computer that we sold to Walmart. So, <laughs> so it's almost like you're giving them away. So, um, so that was, that was the thing that actually killed AST. I have no idea why they could not get this problem under control, but this kept going on for years until the death of the company, and I, I just I don't know why they couldn't get it under control, but that's, that's what the problem was. Now, we had a savior. Samsung was going to come in, and they, they uh, bought up our company uh, right as we were on the brink of bankruptcy. And Samsung had this plan. They wanted to sell um, Samsung computers in the USA but they felt that AST had a stronger brand recognition in the USA than Samsung had. So they decided um, that they would buy the company, they would manufacture the computers, we would put the AST label on them, and we would give support at our facility here with our American accents and everything in the Fort Worth facility, and we would support these computers, and they would be AST, and then consumers would buy them, and that was, that was kind of the plan. Um, <laughs> Samsung knew that our company was in shambles, and they knew that um, uh, it was going to take a few years to to get things um, to get things where they wanted it to be. So, uh, one of the first products that we ended up selling was the AST Essentia M. Now, this is actually a Samsung SensePro 500 rebranded as the AST, 
And uh, we actually started, uh, this is kind of how we slowly started integrating this into our support system. So um, we actually agreed to do Samsung support as well. So Samsung was still selling their own Samsung computers here in the US as well. So sometimes my phone would ring and say Samsung on it. So I would answer, you know, Samsung technical support and I would support the Sense Pro 500, which was the exact same computer as our AST Essentia M. So we knew those computers inside and out anyway. And uh, we liked these computers. They actually worked. They didn't, uh, they didn't catch on fire. They didn't, you know, hinges didn't break on them and, you know, things like that. These were good computers. And so we were, again, we were very um, optimistic about the future of the company because we had good products finally starting to, uh, to trickle out. In fact, what's interesting is uh, very few retailers actually sold both the Samsung and the AST laptops um, on the same shelf. And occasionally we got customers saying, you know, I was looking at those, that AST and that Sense Pro 500. They look really similar. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, what a coincidence. <laughs> so anyway, um, everything was looking um, really optimistic until this happened. <laughs> so Samsung knew that it was going to take two to three years to get our company where it needed to be to profitability. And they had made it clear that they were going to stand behind us and, um, and, and, and make that happen. Oh, and I, f I forgot something. Um, so when they came and took over the company, they wanted to give all the AST employees gifts. And we got to pick between a TV, a VCR, or a microwave oven, all made by Samsung, of course. And so I remember the day that we all backed our car up to the loading dock, and they were handing us off you know, the boxes of all this Samsung products and stuff. And I picked the TV. And interestingly enough, if you go up to the third floor, or we're, actually, we're on the third floor, sorry. <laughs> so if you go down there to the little computer museum, you'll see a Commodore VIC-20 hooked up to a Samsung TV. That's the TV that I got from AST, and it still works today. So, and again, a perfect example of uh, Samsung's uh, durability and reliability. Have that, had, that, had, that, had that been an AST monitor, or <laughs> it probably would have broke a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, this uh, Asian stock market crash of 1997, um, this was a big problem because uh, it affected currency exchange rates dramatically. And so even though Samsung had committed to supporting our company for two to three years, the amount of money they had planned to spend on that was now suddenly like five times more due to the currency exchange rate than what they had planned. And there didn't be, it seemed to be any um, end in sight for this problem. So and a few months later, they announced they were going to close down the company and liquidate the assets. And so that's unfortunately was the end of AST. We all got pink slips. We all got laid off. And um, one last little tidbit about that. Um, this is the uh, front of Blizzard Entertainment. These are the guys that make Warcraft and Starcraft, Diablo, stuff like that, for those who don't know. Uh, that's actually the old AST building. They, uh, they bought the AST campus, and now it lives on as a, another tech company. So anyway, uh, what you all were probably wanting to hear about is the Tales from Tech Support. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you a little bit about how this worked. Uh, we had, I don't have an exact count, but if I had to estimate between the three different shifts, we had a day shift, an evening shift, and a night shift. We probably had 500 people working in tech support at AST. And we had different departments. The Advantage department, which was the largest, that was the consumer desktop department. That was the biggest uh, part of our business at the time. And we needed the most tech support people for that business. Not only that, but let's just say the people that bought those computers were probably a little less computer knowledgeable than the people buying the business laptop, uh, the laptops and the business products. So again, we, just, we needed a larger group of people for the Advantage support line. I actually worked in the Advantage support line for the first year I worked there, and then the second two years I worked in the uh, laptop department. So um, that's me back when I worked at AST. And there's a couple of interesting uh, things about this photo. Not only does it show me in my cubicle there at AST, but that was actually taken on the first ever consumer digital camera, the Casio QV10, which I happened to buy at the time. And uh, it was terrible resolution, but uh, it was a pretty novel thing at the time. Hope to do a review on that camera someday. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's the only picture I could find of myself. Uh, we're gonna, actually, there's a couple of different pictures here. And that's, uh, that's the computer that uh, I did my, my support on. I got a, fun, a few little stories about that computer. First of all, I think that was a 4633 that I was using, and we were running Windows 95, although they did eventually allow some of the more savvy tech support people to put Windows NT4 workstation on their computer, and I was one of the people that did that. So um, um, part of the reason was we had shared drives that tended to go down every now and then. And on Windows 95, if you had a shared drive that was mounted to the server and the server went down, your computer would lock up. 
where Windows NT, the drive would just become unavailable, but your computer would still keep working. <laughs> so I was kind of happy to, to move to Windows NT. But uh, also some of the things that we did on these computers is uh, we played games. Uh, it was not uncommon for me to be playing Duke Nukem 3D or StarCraft while I was helping customers through problems. And you might think, how could you do that? But keep in mind that these calls were really long. And, and a lot of, I mean, every day it was guaranteed I was going to have to help somebody reinstall Windows, whether it be 3.1 or, or uh, Windows 95. And, you know, they had to feed the floppy disks in. It was at least a 30 to 45 minute process, which I'd done hundreds, if not thousands of times. So I knew all that from memory. So I could easily walk customers through the process of installing Windows while I'm, you know, playing Duke Nukem 3D or StarCraft. Now, an interesting story about StarCraft is that we, well, even Duke Nukem, sometimes we played multiplayer games with many of the technicians while we were doing our support calls. And the problem with this is, uh, now normally, like in StarCraft, the person who wins is the person who, you know, is the best at the game and the person who gets the most resources and, and uh, you know, knows how to attack their enemy at just the right time or whatever. But the person who wins back then was the person who was able to keep the game open long enough because eventually something's going to come up where you're going to have to minimize the game and go look up some data or type in an RMA request or something for the customer. And when that happens, everybody's going to come blow up your base. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's just the way that worked. And, of course, our bosses were totally aware that we did this, and they really did not care as long as we were doing our jobs and, and taking care of the, the customers. So, uh, yeah, another angle there of me. Oh, yeah, and I did have hair, by the way, in case, you know, Anybody wanted to know? Yes, I had hair. Um, that was our visionary performers wall. So some of the best techs who uh, did uh, the best work, they, they could come put their um, hand in paint, put it on the wall, and then sign it. And uh, I got to do that as uh, I got recognized for my exemplary performance. So uh, that's about all the photos I've got from there, except that this one. Now, this one I actually cut from a magazine article and uh, scanned it. And uh, I remember this photo. We were actually told to dress formally that day uh, because we were going to have this special photo op. And um, I'm actually in this photo, but you can't see me because I'm uh, way in the back and my you know, I'm, head's like three pixels tall, so you can't see me. But uh, yeah, normally we dressed business uh, casual at work, so this is probably not you know, exactly how we would uh, look on a normal day. But uh, I actually know all these people in this photo. And uh, one little tidbit I'll share is this uh, black guy here on the left, Sean. I, I just recently learned that he passed away, and I was really sad to hear about that. He was a great guy. In fact, all these people were great guys. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I want to tell you about uh, that you can see out of this photo. So, first of all, if you could pan the camera up just a little bit, one of the things that you would see on the back wall is we had this big LED billboard, and it would show the number of calls waiting on hold and how long they've been waiting. And so when you walked into the, to the office, um, you could always glance up at that, and you would get a pretty good idea what the rest of your day was going to be like. Because if it showed there were 30 calls on hold and the wait time was 20 minutes, you'd know, okay, this is going to be a good day. But if you walked in and there was uh, 200 calls on hold and the wait time was two hours, you know that every single customer is going to be very angry at you when you finally do answer the phone. <laughs> so uh, there's a few other things I want to talk about. Um, if you look at these cubicles, they're actually really big. I mean... I don't know the exact square footage, but I mean, you had a lot of space in these cubicles, and there was a good amount of space between you and the person, you know, the other employee next to you. So when you're talking to a customer, the customer could only hear you, and they couldn't necessarily hear the other employees around, which I know a lot of modern call centers is not like that. And I also want to talk a little bit about the vetting process. So when I applied for the job, I went in, and they asked me, like, these really technical questions. Like, okay, if you had a computer and it was doing this problem, how would you solve it? And if they didn't like the answer I gave, they wouldn't hire me. <laughs> and then after they hired people, uh, we were sent to a three-week training course where we went into this classroom. They had all of the AST and Tandy and Grid computers that we were expected to support uh, laid out, and they would go, th go over each machine and tell us all the unique features of this machine, all the nuances, all the things that could break on this machine, and how you would go about fixing it. Um, whether it be driver configuration problems or hardware failures, things like that. So we uh, learned about these machines a lot. They even sent us to a networking class where I learned a lot of the, um, my skills for, you know, everything from IPX and uh, Ethernet, uh, you know, low-level languages and, and, and TCP IP. I don't know why they thought we needed to know that, but we did, and it was, uh, it was a really informative class. 
Uh, we learned we had a special class on viruses. We learned how they worked and uh, how to detect them on customers' computers and just with, from di different behaviors and little tests that we could do and things like that. So, um, and then after we were done with that, they would put us in a cubicle with an experienced employee for about a week while we listen in. And then after the call was over, we could talk to the other employee and they could tell us why they did this or that. And we could ask questions and stuff like that. And then once we were done with that, they put us on the phone by ourselves, And it was up to us to listen to the customer's problem and solve it. And that's kind of a lot different from how it works today. <laughs> um, in fact, just to give you an example, I used to get calls from like IT professionals who would call in who would be having like network problems and stuff, getting the their computers to share a drive or something like that, or TCP IP wasn't working. And I actually had to walk network administrators through how to solve networking problems, which they probably got paid three times what I got paid, but they weren't as knowledgeable as some of us here in the support center. <laughs> so um, that's just an idea of what our support people are like. And then this is kind of like what a modern call center is like. Now, now I have no idea where this picture came from. I just grabbed it off of Google. but um, they just squeeze them in like sardines, and they pay a minimum wage. And that's why when you talk to somebody at one of these call centers, you can hear like five other people around the person you're talking to because they're all squeezed in like sardines. And these people more or less just read off whatever the computer tells them to say. They don't really have any training or troubleshooting in, you know, knowledge of how to solve problems. And um, you know, back in the 90s, a lot of the customers that were calling in, and I mean a lot of them, it was their first computer. I mean, today everybody knows how to use a computer and everybody knows at least some terminology. But back then, the customers calling in, they didn't know anything about computers. I mean, just to give you an example, it was not uncommon when you'd say something like the monitor or the mouse, they wouldn't not know what these things are. And you would have to say stuff like, oh, the thing that looks like a TV screen. And they go, oh, that thing. I mean, this is. This is how inept customers were at the time because they just had no computer experience whatsoever. That also meant they didn't know how to type. And so it was very difficult when you'd get them down to the command line and you would have to be telling them to um, you know, type this or that on the keyboard. And um, they obviously of often didn't know what a colon or a semicolon was or things like that. And so there were a lot of challenges in dealing with the customers. But today, it's, it's almost opposite. Today, you've got like the customers calling in no more than the people working in the support center half the time, which is a, a very big reversal from the way that tech support was you know, back in the 90s. So uh, let's talk about some of the crazy calls that, uh, <laughs> that we got. So you know, this is almost like an urban legend, the, the cup holder thing. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and be honest with you. I never received a call uh, where somebody thought that uh, the CD-ROM was the cup holder. However, some of my coworkers did. So uh, it actually really did happen. In fact, um, we had to listen to the recording one time just to hear that it was really true. But the guy, the guy had apparently sat his coffee on uh, the tray, and when he turned the computer on, or I think he rebooted it, it retracted, and it spilled the coffee all over his keyboard, and he was really upset about that. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad I didn't get that call because I have no idea how it explained that nicely to, to somebody, what the, what the purpose of that is. But this is something that I dealt with all the time. And it was extremely frustrating. So when people called into tech support, even if they had a two-hour hold, which was not terribly unusual, they would have a report recording that would just repeat over and over like a broken record telling you, please have your part number and serial number ready, or you will not be able to receive support. And despite hearing this like 500 times over the course of two hours, you would be absolutely amazed how few people had those numbers ready when I answered the phone. And so then I would have to ask them to get those numbers. And then you know what would happen? Inevitably, I would wind up in an argument with them. They're like, why do I have to give those? And I'm like, well, you know, we have to know what kind of computer you have. And the invariable answer that I would get when I would say something like that is like, well, I have an AST. Or better yet, I have an AST. And I'm like, well, gee, I'm, I would have never thought you'd have an AST calling into AST tech support. But... Uh, yeah, we need to know the exact one. We do make more than one computer, you know. So finally, after struggling with uh, this, uh, they'd be like, oh, okay, all right, I got the part number, serial number for you here. And invariably, I would look up the serial number, and I'd find out it was a keyboard. They'd pull the keyboard upside down, and they'd look at the tag on the bottom and read me that. And I'd go, no, I think you read me the number off the keyboard. I need the number off the computer. And they'd go, oh, okay, okay. Oh, you want the one here on the back of the monitor? 
No, no, I don't want the back or the TV screen, as they'd say sometimes. No, I don't want the number on the back of the monitor. I want the one on the computer. After a minute, they'd finally go, oh, you want the one on the back of the hard drive. And of course, at this point, I don't even want to argue with them over the definition of what a hard drive is. But at this point, I'm like, fine, just the one on the hard drive, great. Just give me that number, <laughs> you know. And so they finally gave me the number. But that, that was, uh, you know, one of the things that people would often complain about when they called in is like, do you know how long I've been on hold? Of course, what always surprised them was I could look down at my phone and it would actually show me the exact time that they had been on hold on the little screen there. And I'd be like, oh, yes, sir, you've been on hold 57 minutes and 42 seconds. They were always really surprised to, to know that I actually knew the answer to that question. And then they said, why did I have to wait on hold so long? And sometimes I would actually tell them, I'm like, well, the 10 customers I had to deal with before you, they didn't have their part number or serial number ready either. And I had to wait on them. <laughs> and that's why you had to wait so long. <laughs> I give a little bit of a guilt trip for them there. Um, so yeah, this is another example of, um, of what the sticker would look like on the back of a lot of the computers. One of the things that we had to learn to do as employees there and tech support is we had to listen really, really well. Now remember what I told you earlier, a lot of these customers had no idea how to type or what things were called on keyboards, whether it be a colon or semicolon or a slash or a backslash. Good God, if you try to tell them the pipe command, they'd never find that one. Uh, Spacebar, however, was also something they often didn't know what was called. And so it was, this was actually an extremely common thing. If I would tell them, type CD space DOS, and that's exactly what they'd type. Trouble is, we didn't have any way to see their screens back then. I mean, not like we can today with remote access and stuff like that. So the only way that you knew they'd be typing something crazy like this is to listen to the number of keystrokes they would type. And if there was a lot of extra keystrokes, then, you know, you might ask them, hey, can you, can you tell me exactly what you're typing there? And, and... <laughs> and eventually sometimes we'd figure out, and yeah, things like um, telling them like the difference between a slash and a backslash and a forward slash, things like that could be really difficult as well. And especially even after you tell them which is the right one and how to find it on the keyboard, they still wind up pushing the wrong one. And you get some weird error message that they would read back to you. And, and you, you know, you couldn't see what was on the screen, so you didn't, you didn't know they were typing in the wrong thing, although you guessed they were typing something wrong. But uh, yeah, these were some of the challenges that we had to deal with back then. Now here's a funny story for you. How many of you are familiar with WinFax? <laughs> Just a few of you here I can see. So let me tell you what WinFax was. Um, back in the 90s, uh, if you wanted to send a fax to somebody from your computer using your fax modem, you needed a fax program. I think Windows later integrated some of this into Windows, but with Windows 95, you needed a third party program to accomplish this. And WinFax was the program we bundled with the computer that did this. Now the way it worked is you could go into like, I don't know, say Microsoft Word, you could type out a document, and then you could hit print. And when you hit print, it would come up with a list of printers, and one of those printers would be the WinFax printer. And you could click the WinFax, and then you could put in the phone number you wanted to fax to, and then it would, it would do its thing. Now, there was a place in the manual that described how all of this worked. And, you know, it explained about going to print something, and then, you know, and it gets so far, and it says whatever's on your screen at this point will be faxed. Well, I had this one customer call in, and he kept saying it wasn't working, and we kept going around and around, and, and, and I kept asking him to read this error message that he said he was getting. He says, well, I, I can't see it right now because there's this paper in the way. I'm like, well, can you move the paper? And he's like, well, I can't. I'm holding it up to the screen. <laughs> I'm like, why, why are you holding paper up to your screen? And he says, well, it says right here in the manual, whatever is on your screen will be faxed. So that was fun explaining to him uh, how that worked. <laughs> so uh, CD-ROMs. Um, when CD-ROMs started to become popular around this time, um, you know, more and more games started showing up on the shelves with CDs in them, and customers, of course, would buy them. And when customers would call in and say their CD drive wasn't working, um, you know, I'd get their serial number from them, and I would be like, well. Um, your computer doesn't appear to have shipped with a CD drive. Did you have this installed somewhere? And they would, no, no, this absolutely came with a computer when I bought it. And I would ask them, can you describe what this CD-ROM looks like? And they'd say, well, it's this little slot in the front of the computer, and there's this little lever that you pull down in front of it. And so, of course, what they had is a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. And a CD will, in fact, fit in there if you put it in there. <laughs> 
So I'd have to explain to them what that was. And then, of course, the inevitable question that would come after that is like, well, how do I get it out? <laughs> and then uh, I'm like, well, you know, you can try some tweezers. You can try picking up the computer and shaking it upside down. You know, sometimes it would come out. Sometimes they would have to take it into an authorized service center to get it, um, <laughs> get it removed. <laughs> but the other thing that happened a little bit later, we did start shipping computers with CD-ROM drives. And um, so people would buy these CD recordables on the shelves because they'd say, oh, well, hey, it'd be nice to record stuff. So they would call me up and say, well, my CD-ROM drive's not working because I put these CD recordables in and it says it, it can't write to them. And then I have to explain to them, like, well, it's a CD read-only memory. It only reads. And you'd be surprised how many people were irate to find out that, like, we scammed them or something. I, how, how could you possibly ship this product that can only read? You did this as a scam, so I would have to upgrade or something like that. I'm like, no, they're all like that. You have to spend, like, $1,000 to get, like, a writer. And, yeah, people were not willing to accept that very well. But um, that was something we had to deal with a lot. Oh, boy, speakerphones. So beyond the fact I hated it when people called me on speakerphones because it was really difficult to hear sometimes, especially if there were other ambient noises in the house. I also really hated it when people called me when they were chewing on food and drinking and had crying babies on their shoulder and a variety of other irritating noises um, that I had to listen to sometimes when I was trying to help people. But, but uh, the real irritation was, uh, was this product that we had uh, with our consumer desktops. It came with a, uh, we started shipping them with a special modem that was not only a modem, but it was also doubled as an answering machine and a speakerphone. And of course, the way this worked was, um, actually, this is probably not hard to imagine today because, you know, voicemail's been around for a long time, but basically you'd leave your computer on 24 hours a day, which back then was kind of an unusual, unusual thing to do. Uh, but you'd leave your computer on, and when the phone rings, if nobody answered it, after a few rings, it would answer, it would play a message, and then it would record your caller's message, and then you could come back and see a list on your screen of all the messages you had and play them back. People thought that was really cool. And it also had this speakerphone feature where, I don't know why people would want to use this, but you could use the internal, or the, the speakers on your computer and then this stupid little piece of junk microphone we used to ship with those computers, and you could talk to somebody with like a speakerphone. The problem was, all this sounded great in theory, and it was actually a big selling point for these computers, and we weren't the only ones selling. I think Packard Bell and some of the other low-end machines were shipping with stuff like this, too, as kind of a, uh, a lure for, for, uh, for some sales. The problem is it never worked right. Uh, the software was glitchy. It uh, crashed all the time. Uh, in many cases, it would uh, corrupt itself and just wouldn't even run anymore. Customers were always having to call in, and we, we would have to walk them through how to uninstall the software, reinstall the software, and all the steps, it took like 30, 45 minutes. And then the next day, half the time, it would corrupt itself again. And they'd be back on the phone again. And sometimes we'd go through this a dozen times with people. And people, after it happened a few times, would, would start to get very irate. And, and I'm going to quote you something I heard dozens of times after people got to read about this. They would say, I spent $3,000 on this computer. And all I wanted it for was the speakerphone. And it doesn't work. And I want my money back. We we're not allowed to be rude to the customers, but I so badly wanted to tell them, dude, if you go down to Radio Shack for about $12, you can buy a speakerphone, and it always works every time. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, that was not an option to tell them. But I so badly wanted to tell customers that when they would, when they would say that. Because I, I don't know who would spend $3,000 on a speakerphone. This is kind of a crazy thing, so... During the time I worked there, we had quite a few different computers, and we were up into the Pentium era. In fact, I think we were selling Pentium II machines around 97, if memory serves. And, um, but just as an example, I'm going to use this Pentium 166 here as an example. So um, say somebody goes out to the store, and they buy an AST computer, and it had a Pentium 166 in it. It was the latest and greatest at the time. They spent $3,000 on it or whatever. And uh, they're happy with it. And then I get this call, and they would, they would say, well, I bought this... AST with this Pentium 166 processor in it. it was top of the line. I spent $3,000 on it. I'd be like, okay, well, there's something wrong with it. It's like, yeah, I went back to the store today, and now you have a 200 megahertz unit on the shelf. And I'm like, okay. Well, I wanted to have the top of the line. They told me this was the top of the line when I bought it. Now it's not, and I want my money back, or I want you to upgrade me for free. I kid you not, I received this call hundreds of times from different people who thought that for some reason we were just supposed to stop innovating and just because they bought the top of the line. And uh, I don't know exactly why people would think that, but that was an extremely common call. And the other problem we had that's sort of similar to this 
is people would go out and buy a computer, and then they had these benchmarking programs that you could go out and buy. And some of them were actually built into DOS. I don't remember what it was called. There was some DOS command you could type if you started looking through the folders, and it would bring up a small little uh, diagnostic program, and it would tell you, uh, you know, the information like how much RAM your computer had and what video card it had and what kind of processor it had. Well, a lot of those programs uh, were older and they didn't recognize anything above a 386. And so they would run these stupid diagnostic programs and it would say they have a 386 CPU. And so then they would be calling us up on the phone irate saying that we ripped them off. You know, I spent $3,000 on this computer. How many times have I heard that? And <laughs> it was supposed to have a Pentium 200 in there and it says I have a 386. And the only way I could console these, I mean, I would try to explain to them, well, I'm sorry, the program just doesn't recognize newer CPUs other than 386. And many of them just flat out wouldn't believe that. And so I had to actually walk them through opening the case on the computer, which is something they could do. I mean, it doesn't void your warranty to open the case, although a lot of them thought that it would. I'm like, no, you've got to be able to put, like, expansion cards and stuff in there, you know. And then I would walk them through how to remove the heat sink on the CPU so that they could act and wipe away the grease so that I actually see that it is, in fact, a Pentium CPU. And then usually they would be kind of <laughs> a little bit consoled and apologetic at that point. But... Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was something we had to deal with. <sighs> all right. Now, I know I said all of the technicians we had at AST were good and knowledgeable, and for the most part, that was accurate. But we did have a handful, which uh, were not so good. And I worked right next to one of them in the cube next to me. And I did not like what, the, what this guy did a lot. So he had this habit of uh, any time a customer would call in with a problem that either he didn't know how to solve or a problem that he thought would take him too long to solve, he would simply tell the customer to run scan disk, and then when that was done, to run defrag, and then reboot the computer, and if it didn't work, call us back. And of course, it almost never fixed any problem, and so of course they would call back, and of course, guess who would usually get them on the phone the second time they called, when they're far more angry after waiting on hold two, two more hours. Uh, it would usually be me, and so I would have to walk them through the correct fix for the computer. Now, part of the reason this guy did this is because we were judged somewhat by our stats, how many calls we took a day. Now, a lot of people would be surprised to find that I only took about 20 calls a day for an eight-hour work shift. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like very many, but a lot of the calls that we had to deal with were 30, 40-minute calls. So, uh, you know, 20 calls was doing good for me, but uh, this guy had like 40 calls a day. You know? And so he always felt like, ooh, look at my, he's always bragging about his stats. Look at my stats. I took 40 calls today. You know, fortunately, our boss did listen into our, our phone calls. So, you know, that message you hear when you call a lot of companies about your call may be monitored or recorded. We had a similar message. And so, yeah, many cases the boss was listening in on the calls. And so he knew my stats may not have looked as good as his, but he knew, by golly, when I was done with the customer, it was fixed or I was sending them apart to get it fixed or whatever we needed to do. <laughs> and I wasn't telling them to run scan disk and defrag. We had this other employee, by the way, um, and he had a really odd behavior. Uh, so we had these mute buttons on our phone, and, and you could push. It was a toggle button. Like, you push it once, the light comes on, and it's muted, and then you push it again, and it goes off. You know, some of the older mute buttons, you had to physically hold them down while you, while you talked. Well, he had this thing where he'd be talking to a customer, and he'd be like, okay, click there, click this, and read me what it says there. And then out of nowhere, he'd push this button, and he'd start yelling, like, you stupid bleepity bleep idiot, what a bleepity bleep moron, why can't you figure out this bleep 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 computer? And then he let off the mute button and said, okay, did you click on that yet? Okay, yeah, there they go. And he was so loud, so he was three cubes down from me, and he was so loud sometimes my customers could hear that over my headset, and he'd be like, is that, a, is that one of your employees talking to a customer like that? And I would always have to cover for him and say, no, 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 he was having an argument with another employee over there, don't, don't worry about him, you know, let's, let's go on with this. One day, he did push that mute button, and I guess he didn't get it good enough. The light didn't light up, and he went off on a customer like that. No. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy, what a day that was. Uh, surprisingly, he didn't get fired over that, um, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was quite amusing. <laughs> uh, and he wasn't wrong. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the things he was saying were correct. In many cases, they were bleepity bleep idiots, uh, but, you know, you just... You know, say that kind of thing. Anyway, that is the end of my presentation. How much time we got? Ooh, right on schedule, 45 minutes. Because I'll tell you what I do. I got three things I'm going to be giving away. I have, these are literally the last five of these in existence. This was a very limited run. These are vinyl records of the Planet X3 soundtrack. 
They're very nice. Uh, and I decided to hold these last five. I was going to give them away here because there will never be any more. And then I'm going to give away five copies of Planet X3, the box set game. And then whatever is left over after that, I've just got some Planet X3 soundtrack cassettes I'll give away. So since these are far less valuable, plus the fact that you get one of those inside the game anyway, uh, what we'll do is we'll draw the tickets, and then uh, I'll let you pick like what you want. And then I guess whoever's first gets to pick first. So. We're going to do it right here. It shouldn't take very long. Oh, gosh. Um, I guess while we're waiting on that, did you ever get the uh, foot pedal call? Not me. No. <clears throat> I didn't get the foot pedal call, but uh, one of my coworkers did. It was actually a really old lady, <laughs> and she w the, the tech kept telling her to use the mouse, and she, she didn't know what that was. And she was trying to get the computer set up. Like, she just brought it home from the store and couldn't figure out how to plug all the stuff in. And uh, when he finally described to her what it looked like, she said, oh, I thought that was a foot pedal like my sewing machine. And so he, yeah, had to tell her what that was for. So, yeah, somebody did get that call. Not me, though. <laughs> Any other questions while we're waiting on the tickets here? Did you ever have to frequently say, have you tried turning it off and turning it on again? <laughs> I don't think I ever said it exactly like that. I think we would say, you know, let's try rebooting it or something to that effect. Uh, but most of the time, customers usually tried that already before they called in. Because, I mean, they're waiting on hold for two hours. You know, they're usually going to try some stuff on their own. <laughs> but uh, I am curious if, if anyone ever asked... Uh, how to turn the monitor to channel three? They thought that would fix it. Did that ever happen? No, no, I don't think, I don't think so. Any other? It doesn't have to be about IST. You can ask me about anything in the few minutes we got left. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. What was the most esoteric piece of hardware that you helped someone install, like a esoteric uh, expansion card or something, like something really weird that someone wanted to install? Well, I usually didn't help them with stuff like that because if it didn't come with a computer, we were not supposed to support it. And we believe me, we got calls all the time. People wanting us to help uh, help us install, you know, software that they bought at the store or hardware. But our job usually was to say, no, you need to call that company's tech support for help with that. Uh, sometimes they did call us because, like, well, I already called them and they said there's something wrong with the computer, and so and then they would wind up calling us. And then, you know, there's only so much we can do in a situation like that, so we would. You know, we'd listen to what their problem was, but nine times out of ten, we'd say, well, look, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, unless there's something you can physically point out as being wrong with the computer other than not working with this product, there's just not much I can do to help you. <laughs> um, I, I don't really remember any specifically bizarre piece of hardware or anything, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> any other questions about anything, AST or 8-Bit Guy or 8-Bit Keys? Or yeah, I'm actually uh, not familiar with this game up here. What is it? Oh, it's a game I wrote, and uh, I've sold several thousand copies of it already. Um, I usually sell them for 40 bucks each, so I'm, I'm <laughs> being pretty generous today. It runs on IBM uh, PCs. It'll run as, uh, on as little as a 4.77 megahertz XT with CGA, or it'll run on um, later machines with VGA. It's a real-time strategy game. Everybody got a ticket? What I'm going to do is I'm going to hand the... Uh, I'm going to hand the microphone to Jordan here. She's going to call ticket numbers, and you raise your hand, and I'll tell me what you want, and I will bring it to you. 